Welcome to chapter number five, which is, as you can see, aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Just to make sure that it's crystal clear, aggregate in this particular case means the sum of all the individual parts or the total or the grand total. That helps you understand the concept a little bit better. We're going to look again at GDP, which is, of course, a big part of macroeconomics. We're going to look at uh, aggregate supply and aggregate demand and the equilibrium point. We're going to look at factors that affect aggregate demand and aggregate supply. We're going to talk about in, uh, recessions and inflation uh, and some disagreements between neoclassical economics and uh, John Maynard Keynes, Keynesian economics. He revolutionized the, at least the thoughts on economics. Uh, and have people look at economics in a very different point of view. Uh, and some people still uh, subscribe to his point of view. So we're going to talk about more, the more modern uh, concepts of aggregate demand and supply. We have potential GDP, which is considered to be a vertical line. Long. Uh, you know, in this particular case, it's the uh, the um, AS is aggregate supply. So this is long run aggregate supply is considered to be a vertical line, and that's potential GDP. Uh, quality and quantity of labor. So the, how many people we have um, and the quality of those resources. People are now more educated than they've ever been relative to their predecessors. Uh, again, the capital goods that are available, the rate of technological change has, has increased dramatically. And then, of course, natural resources. So you can see that the whole line will shift out. It does not tilt. It just moves further. So if the, in this particular case, and that's what we want, then there's more for everybody. Uh, and then we have less unsatisfied wants and needs. So increase in GDP is normally uh, considered to be a very positive thing, but we talked about uh, some of the downsides of increased GDP about pollution, um, et cetera, and the environmental impact. So you can see that the business cycle is made up of four um, components. You can have a trough, then you have expansion, which is where it's increasing. You have the peaks uh, and uh, you have contraction. So if you're at the bottom, at the bottom of the trough, then it will go through an expansion phase. It will peak and then it'll start to decline. And that goes over and over again. And the length and the severity is what matters. You can see that in 2008 uh, till almost basically 2010, there was a couple years there due to the housing crisis, which I expect you're too young to, um, to know about, had it actually caused the growth rate to be negative, which would be a recession. And if a recession continues long enough, it's called a depression. But you can see there's ups and downs. Uh, COVID caused uh, another recession. And then, uh, you know, it, go it goes up and down, it repeats. But what you can see is the frequency and the duration, how how high the amplitude, how low is the low and how high is the high. And then how quickly does it go from recession to expansion or from expansion to um, you know, decline? All right, so again, aggregate supply um, is the total quantity of goods and services produced by all sellers. And we factor out the price increases due to inflation and low price levels implies lower profit and lower level of output so in this particular case uh, in the short run uh, higher prices will will increase aggregate supply go from y1 to y2 when we have talked already about nominal versus real the amount of goods and services employee uh, can buy for a given amount of a nominal wage. Remember, that includes inflation. And so in this particular case, the present day value of the current wage, wage, sorry, 
the nominal rate divided by the price level. So that will tell you whether your earning power is actually increased or decreased. For a lot of people these days with inflation being as high as it is, again, this is the fall of 2023, and you know inflation is varying from a low of just over 3% to it was 7% not that long ago, people are falling further behind. That's what it really means. It's harder and harder to pay your bills because your increases to your income is not keeping up with the increases to your costs. So you can see again, a uh, similar type of graph. We're looking at real GDP. So aggregate demand, uh, consumption, investment, government spending and next exports. We did this in an earlier chapter. So in this particular case, it's downward sloping, which we're used to with demand. Uh, higher interest rates cause investment to go down and higher prices make Canadian exports less attractive. So this is why aggregate demand goes downward sloping. So then you have the blue line, which is aggregate demand, the red line, which is aggregate supply, and then you get an equilibrium point between the real GDP and the price levels. You've used this, this should be very, very familiar from your days in microeconomics. And when the price is above the equilibrium, you have a surplus because more will be provided. The S, um, the, the where price intersects AS will be to the right of where the price, inter uh, the price intersects AD. So you have a surplus. And just like you learned in microeconomics, when the price is below the equilibrium, you have a shortage because suppliers say, I'm not, I'm not going to make this. I'm not going to make enough money. But there'll still be the demand for it. So there will be uh, a shortage. The price is not high enough to warrant an increase in supply. This is where we want to be. We have the short run um, and the long run uh, aggregate supply. And when the, all three of them, all three of the lines intersect, we have full employment and equilibrium. This is what people like the Bank of Canada, they try to manage the economy. They would like the economy to be at full employment and, in, and then add an equilibrium between aggregate supply and aggregate demand. So once again, uh, if the equilibrium point, the short run of AS and AD is to the left, you have a shortage, which is called a recessionary gap. So if you just read again the graph, the economy will be operating where AS intersects AD where the red line and the blue line intersect. And that is below where it could be. So that is recession. If it's above, what it causes is inflation. You have increases to uh, prices and you have an inflationary gap. So to the left is a recessionary gap and to the right is an inflationary gap. So in this particular case, we want, uh, under test your knowledge, I'll give you again. You can you can pause us any time to uh, see where you're at, as far as like whether you know how to do this or not. So in this particular case, the equilibrium is where demand equals supply. That should be nice and straightforward. The price is 95. The demand will be 1150, and the supply will be only 1025. This is so much like microeconomics. You just remember, it's the total. So you have a shortage. So changes in consumption, uh, consumer wealth, age of the durables, uh, and consumer confidence is a big part of it. If you think you're going to lose your job, you probably will not go out and buy a an expensive item. Like if you think that your job is a little bit shaky or your company is is not doing very well and there may be layoffs you may not go out and buy a new car and find out next week that you're laid off uh changes in investment are affected by interest rates obviously the purchase price 
how old your capital goods are. Uh, so the older your capital goods, more likely you are to replace them. Again, business expectations. You're not going to be buying and spending money when you don't expect um, there to be an increase in your business. In fact, one of the things that has come up recently is uh, in the fall of 2023 is airlines. The um, pr president of Boeing Airlines was rather surprised they're getting as many orders as they are. And part of that is because people are traveling again. And so the comp you know, airline companies need new planes. Again, changes in government regulations. Uh, the exchange rate has a big part on net exports. Uh, income levels elsewhere in the world. So if they're going up, they'll want more Canadian goods. Again, the price of foreign goods. And again, the taste of, uh, you know, the taste of what foreigners like, if they like products from Canada or not. So in this particular case, this would shift the entire line, either up uh, as an increase to demand or down to 83. So here's a nice summary for you. Uh, what, what affects consumption? And for investments, you can see that what causes it go up or down as far as like uh, aggregate demand. Again, for net exports and uh, for the government spending. The, the government reduces tax rates, which we would like. Government spending goes down. So again, you can pause this, so I'm not going to take a lot of time on it. So here's increases and decreases. Star market going down, people have less wealth. Interest rates will cause people to be more hesitant because more to buy things because they have to pay a higher interest rate. Decreases in government spending. It's not good for aggregate demand. They're just like a big consumer. Increase in foreign incomes. They will buy more goods in uh, Nigeria, but they'll also buy more goods from Canada. Or certainly our biggest trading partner would be in the United States. So if the United States economy is doing well, it helps with our our um, aggregate demand. And then, of course, a decrease in the exchange rate has the opposite effect. Low um, Canadian dollar boosts, makes our, our, gives us a cost competitive advantage over some uh, other countries. Uh, again, economic growth is due to change in the human ca uh, capital. Again, the, um, the knowledge and the quantity the uh, change in the amount of capital, uh, the investments, technological change, and change in natural resources. So you can see that the long run average supply shifts from LAS1 to LAS2. And you can see the short run just moves further to the right. So aggregate supply goes from AS1 day s2 so in this particular case real gdp can actually go up and the prices do not have to go up if there's a change in factor prices this is what we we're talking about with inflation it will shift uh aggregate supply to the right and lower the uh, gdp so again i'm going to let you I'll pause for just a moment. Increase in the price of imported crude means, again, more money goes out of the country, and we would buy less of it. Increase in the number of immigrants. This is what the federal government has determined, that we need more immigrants. And uh, so that means there's just going to be more people buying. Those immigrants will become permanent residents, uh, they'll also uh, become Canadian citizens, but they buy more. Discovery of oil deposits in Canada will increase, obviously, the supply. Uh, increases in wage settlements will, will cause empl employers to cut back. They're going to have to charge more, and when the price goes up, the supply goes down. And then 
improvement in technologies, which makes people more productive, will actually increase aggregate supply. So pro improvements to productivity caused by technology or, or gains, better ways of doing things, will increase aggregate supply. Again, just as this plotting aggregate supply, and you can see as the prices go up, the supply goes up. So here we are, just in a graphic form. So again, there's a multiplier effect. Uh, and because some of that money is spent over and over again. So in this particular case, it's each time an extra dollar goes into the economy, it has a multiplier effect in the fact that that dollar uh, will, will, some of it will come out through leakages, but some of it will get spent again. And then out of that, say in this case, using these numbers, a $10 increase in income, $4 will come out because of leakages. So $6 will get spent. Then 40% uh, will get, will be part of the leakage. 60% of the $6 will be spent again. And then 60% of the $3 and 60 cents, et cetera, et cetera. So the one, the $10 increase in this case has 10, 16, 19.6, et cetera. So it, it has a ripple effect. So in this particular case, an increase in aggregate demand raises both prices and real GDP. You can see from uh, one person's spending becomes another person's income, and then they will spend part of that money. Again, same kind of thing, except this is aggregate supply. You can see that you'll have actually with increased aggregate supply, will increase real GDP, but you'll get lower prices where increase to demand, aggregate demand increases prices. Right. So if the two increase equally for uh, aggregate supply for short run and long run, you will get a price, um, it'll go back to P1. It'll go down to P2 and then it'll go back up to to um, P1. So if they're both equal. So in this case, what are the equilibrium values? Again, it should be fairly straightforward. When demand equals supply, right back to the very basics of when you took, you know, the first couple of chapters in econ. So this is a different graph. Aggregate demand decreases by $200 at every price level. So you'll get a different answer. At 95, you'll get 17 and 17 rather than the, the previous screen. So again, you just read it. When aggregate demand equals aggregate supply, you're at equilibrium. We talked about this a little earlier. In this particular case, aggregate demand increases to demand because something has become more popular so aggregate supply stays the same so you can see by the graph on the left that will cause prices to go up and you can also see that if there's an increase in the cost or the supply cost push then you can see that the costs of the goods go up but there's no change in in demand and we know that if the supply in this case Aggregate supply goes up and demand stays the same, the price goes up. And you can and you can see that there's then a gap between the Y1 and Y2 real GDP. So in the first one on ag, uh, aggregate demand, 
uh, real GDP goes from Y1 to Y2, so it increases. In the second one, it on the graph on the right, it, um, well, it goes back from Y2 to Y1. So in this particular case, recession, this is what the government's trying to avoid, or not necessarily even the government, but the Bank of Canada. They want to slow down inflation, which they feel is too high because it eats people's earning power and makes it harder to live. And so they want to, they do not necessarily want to cause a recession, but they want to slow the economy down because it's, it's literally performing too well so that you have high inflation which is considered to be a negative. Basic model of uh, economics is basically laissez-faire, let the market decide. The market is efficient, the market knows. It will, uh, knows what the price will be, that shortages and surpluses will be temporary, and that the economy is always at full employment. So that in this particular case, uh, you see that A81 to 82 just causes an increase in the price level only, but the GDP is stays the same. Keynesian says that markets are not very competitive, that what they talk about prices and wages are sticky, in particular sticky down, so that if you're making $20 an hour, it's not likely people would be very much against this that next year you're going to make less money that's your wage would actually go down people are very um against that they'll give up other things but not have their wages go down see smaller uh, paychecks so in keynesian economics uh it views this at um aggregate supply in the short run is horizontal so that uh, you have aggregate demand from 81 to 82. Your um, income goes up. Your your GDP goes up. But it's, it doesn't increase prices because of the stickiness. The modern view uh, says that a change in the aggregate demand depends on the condition of the economy. Uh, that major recessions does have a big effect on GDP. And if you're close to the potential GDP, there'll be more inflationary pressure. So the modern view is that they're both right. In a recession, the economy acts like Keynesian economics, and that in uh, when there's not a recession, the economy looks more like what's called the neoclassical. So where this really came to place was in the Great Depression. It was only the neoclassical, and they just thought, oh, the economy will fix itself. And as it turned out, the Keynesian economics was, I won't say proven, but is believed to be correct when there are significant downturns. So something more modern than the Great Depression, which even I wasn't close to being alive, uh, and I hope we never go through something like that again, is the COVID pandemic. Even the most conservative types of uh, thinkers, the governments realized that they had to pump a lot of money into the economy to keep the economy going. Years ago, the government would have cut back and it actually would have made things worse. So at federal and provincial levels, they pumped billions and billions of dollars into the economy during the COVID pandemic. And they did this on a worldwide basis because it needed to be coordinated between all the major economic powers in the world. Otherwise, the entire world could have gone into um, a major, not just recession, but depression. And it would have had catastrophic effects throughout the entire world uh, uh, and would still be in 2023 still prevalent. But the governments propped things up when they were at, where the economies were at the weakest points. And now the economy is much stronger. So in a recession, recessionary gap, wages fall. 
and aggregate supply shifts right until you get natural um, uh, full employment is reached again and GDP, real GDP is higher and prices are lower. So just think about this. In recessions, what happens? People don't aren't able to demand as high a wage. And you, you know, so also there's people not buying as much. So prices can be um, lower. Inflationary gap, which is to the right of the long run average supply curve, GDP goes down and you get prices that are higher and wages rise. So again, here is a summary of chapter number five.